Hello there, and welcome to the reading portion of the Let's Play. There was just so very much in this diary, and I don't feel like I read it very well in the Let's Play itself. And since there was so much text of it, uh, I decided it should go in its own separate video. And since I was going to do that, I might as well reread all of this. I will have some timestamps for you if you would just like to pause the video and go to whatever page. There will be those timestamps. I think I'll put them on the screen and in the description. We'll see what happens there. Also, you don't really need to follow this uh, all the way through. What What's said here in the diary is like... Basically, it's just lore, basically. If you really want to get into the Warburg family and, and all that gubbins, then yeah, this will be uh, the section for you. But it doesn't really have it too much of a bearing on the rest of the story. And you definitely don't have to, to sit through all of this to understand what's going on. What my my summary, uh, <clears throat> my summary even was, was well enough. It was good enough. All the main points were in there and it's... It's all you really need to know. But with that set, uh, let's just get on with it and we'll start the, uh, the reading marathon now. May 14th, 1930. Yesterday, something terrible happened. I do not know who to turn to, who to talk to, so I decided to write it down. You, dear diary, are now my confidant and sole guardian of my secret thoughts. Hans lies in the next room teetering between life and death, and I am terrified. Oh, the injustice of life. First Mama, then Hans. Please stay, Lord. Don't take my little brother away from me as well. May 15th, 1930. Hans made me promise to keep this a secret, but its burden is too heavy. I know I can tell you, though, dear diary, we discovered a cave in the mountains, a marvelous cavern with ancient paintings, paintings on the walls. Only prehistoric man could have painted them because they were depictions of mammoths, which are prehistoric creatures as well. That much I know. I hate mammoths now. It's all because of them and because of that stupid prehistoric children's toy. Why, Hans? Or why did you try and take it? And why did I let you climb up there? It's my fault that you're in a coma now. Hans, if you die, I do not know how I could ever forgive myself. May 16th, 1930. Hans has still not regained consciousness. Father cannot sleep and Gertrude cries all day long. Outside the heat is suffocating. But inside the house is icy cold and dismal. I still have hope though. I know my brother, I know his strength. He will pull through. He never gives in. May 17th, 1930. I cannot think of anything else but Hans. In all my waking and sleeping dreams, I see his fall over and over. I see his head hitting the rock and his oh so pale face softening. I have taken refuge in the attic. It is the only place where I can find any peace wrapped up in my memories. May 18th, 1930. Five days has passed since the accident, and Hans has still yet to open his eyes. To see him like this is unbearable. Please, God, protect him. Take my life, not his. May 19th, 1930. I feel so desperate, so alone. I want to snuggle up in my father's arms, but I dare not. He is just too impassive. Oh, Hans, don't leave me here. May 20th, 1930. It has happened. Hans has come back to life. He opened his eyes and uttered my name. My name? Do you realize this is the happiest day of my life? I want to take to the streets and sing to proclaim my joy to the world. Thank you. Oh, thank you, God. May 22nd, 1930. How wonderful, how beautiful life is. Gertrude and I cannot stop breaking into uncontrollable fits of giggles. Hans even woofed down his meal today. I knew he was tough, my little brother. Even father smiled at me today when he said good morning. May 25th, 1930. I don't know whether I'm coming or going. I'm totally absorbed in Hans's recovery. 
I have scarcely five minutes to myself to return to my refuge and scribble down these words. May 29th, 1930. It is very curious whether Hans is hungry, thirsty, or if he wants something, he cannot stop saying my name. He can't bear it when I leave him for even an instant. Gertrude thinks I should move my bed into his room to help him sleep better. I hope the father will agree. June 2nd, 1930. Today was the first day that Hans has left the house. He went for a short walk in the garden, but Hans is still very weak. The doctor said he should be patient and shouldn't rush him. It is so hard though. I hope so much that life can return to how it once was. June 20th, 1930. Hans has been out of his coma for a month now. He still doesn't say much and has difficulty moving. He sits motionless for long periods of time, his eyes wide open as though lost in thought. I often have to call his name several times before he reacts. Then he will smile and when he does the moment is magic for me and I couldn't possibly be happier. June 22nd, 1930. I had to talk to him. The burn was too great. I asked Hans about the accident in the cave to find out what he could remember. He could utter only one word, mammoth, and his eyes glowed so strangely when he said it that it frightened me. September 15th, 1930. I go back to school today and for the first time in my life I am dreading it. I am afraid of leaving Hans alone, despite Gertrude's kindness and attention. I have the impression that Hans is much less nervous when I am here. October 20th, 1930. While I was doing my homework yesterday evening, Hans crept up on me so quietly that he made me jump. He took a pencil and a blank sheet of paper and curiously he started drawing. It is the first time since his accident he has done anything but daydream. October 28th, 1930. Hans scribbles almost obsessively. It is all he will do, all day long. It feels... I feel it annoys father. Nobody else understands, but I can see that Hans is trying to draw mammoths. November 16th, 1930. Today is my birthday and Gertrude has made me an apple pie, my favorite. But father has not returned home for lunch and Hans hasn't doesn't want to leave his room. The best present I could ever have is to see Hans back to the way on recovery. December 25th, 1930. Snow is falling. It is so beautiful. January 10th, 1931. The doctor visited to examine Hans. He seems happy that my little brother has fully recovered his faculties. It truly is a miracle. I don't understand why he doesn't talk more though. Why isn't he livelier like he was before? February 9th, 1931. It is Hans's birthday today. He is 11 years old. I have the strangest of impressions that actually he has lost five years rather than gained one more. February 24th, 1931. The doctor has just left. I saw him whispering with father. The serious expressions worried me awfully. What could he be hiding from me? I am grown up now. At the age of 15 you can understand everything. I am too scared to ask father what is happening. March 15th, 1931. I have been thinking and it seems to me that Hans's attitude isn't normal. The shock of the fall and his coma must have had much more serious effects than we first imagined. Hans, my dear brother, what is happening to you? April 4th, 1931. I have discovered the truth. Hans is stunted physically and mentally. I eavesdropped a conversation between the doctor, father and Gertrude. Gertrude buried her tear-filled eyes in her apron and father muttered the word retard under his breath. How could he say such a thing? April 13th. 1931. It is Easter and we are on school holidays. This means I can spend all day with Hans and protect him from father's permanent dark moods. He cannot accept that the fact that Hans, his only son, will stay in the state forever. 
April 14th, 1931. It is truly difficult to accept, but it is not Hans's fault. Mine, maybe, but not Hans's. I don't know how to make father understand. He seems full of hatred for him. It is dreadful. I feel so powerless. May 14th, 1931. One year. One year has gone by, and it feels like an eternity. The situation shows no signs of improvement, neither in terms of Hans's mental health or father's attitude toward him. May 30th, 1931. Extraordinary, father has decided to take Hans to Paris for new tests. He says that only in the French capital will he find truly competent doctors. We must make Hans ready for the great expedition. June 6th, 1931. No news from father and Hans, but I remain hopeful. I am sure they will take good care of my little brother. July 15th, 1931. They have returned. Hans rushed into my arms and started crying. It took me a long time to calm him down and get him to go to sleep. Father is still as taciturn as he was before he left. The French doctors have confirmed the diagnosis. diagnosis. Hans will remain physically and mentally impaired. I am stunned. August 28, 1931. The summer is coming to a close. It has been less stifling than the last. The sun has put color in Hans's cheeks. When I look at him, I have difficulty imagining that he will not change. November 16th, 1931. Father still says nothing and increasingly shuts himself away in his office in the f at the factory. Christmas, Gertrude tells me that love and faith triumph over any science. I lack neither. God be praised. January 12th, 1932. Father took Hans to the factory this morning. Hans was so afraid that I accompanied them. Fortunately, father said nothing. I fail to understand why he insists on bringing him there. January 13th, 1932. Father left for the factory with Hans once again this morning. I think he wants to persuade Hans that he could be useful for something. It is his way of resisting fate. February 17th, 1932. For a month now, every morning Hans has gone to work with Father at the factory. I'm not exactly sure what he does there, but he seems to enjoy it. I feel my brother's behavior has changed considerably. He is much less capricious. April 14th, 1932. I could cry. Hans made me a present, a small robot mammoth with a trunk that rises and falls. When father saw it, he nodded his head in satisfaction. May 20th, 1932. Both Gertrude and father now have their own robot mammoths. Theirs are even more intricate and finely tuned. Little brother is not such a retard after all. October 15th, 1932. Hans's mammoths now walk, raise their trunks and wag their tails. It's incredible. December 22nd, 1932. I met the head of the factory workshop, Mr. Grips, this morning. He says that for a young lad of 12, Hans is very gifted. It is a shame he only makes elephants. February 11th, 1933. Father and Hans was locked in a long discussion yesterday. Or should I say Hans was locked in one of father's long monologues? As it is inconceivable that Hans should go to school like other children, Father wants to take him on as a work at the factory. However, Hans will have stopped making his own little devices. His silence, his gaping mouth and staring eyes finally sent Father off in a rage. February 12th, 1933. I tried to breach the subject with Hans. I suggested he should obey Father. Learning a craft at the factory is his one chance to do something constructive with his life. He is so gifted and takes so much pleasure in making automatons. He did look like he wasn't listening to me, but I know he'll think about what I said. February 20th, 1933. It is not that Hans cannot speak, it's rather that he doesn't want to speak. He uses the least possible words for communication, except with me, but he is still very economical with his words. May 15th, 1933. Incredible! Hans was not just satisfied with learning how to 
the assembly line works, instead he's completely redesigned it. Father and Monsieur Grips are taking a serious look at his plans. July 10th, 1933. Father has wanted to talk to me about the future since I passed my exams. He wants to send me to university because he says my intelligence is astounding. My heart was beating so loud. It is true I do love studying, but I couldn't bear to be away from Hans. September 2nd, 1933. What a ghastly summer. I have been permanently torn between my desire to go to university and my refusal to leave my brother. I talked about it with Hans, but he said nothing. This, that same evening, I found my own little mammoth broken. October 9th, 1933. Hans had another fit of hysterics at dinner again. Father announced that Hans's new assembly line would soon be finished. However, they have removed the automaton parrot that shout orders, as they deemed it superfluous. Hans was livid. He hurled his soup dish to the ground and stormed off to his bedroom. What will happen between both of them when I'm not here? October 17th, 1933. Despite my scruples, I am finally leaving. Hans has not talked to me for a week. Father would not understand if I told him why I wanted to stay. My heart is so heavy. Christmas. It is so strange to be home. I had never left home for such a long time before. Once we were alone, Hans did not stop talking. Words just leapt from his mouth. How we laughed at his excitement. He presented me with a delightful little ballerina to replace the mammoth, he told me. I was so touched that I started crying. Distance has done nothing to harm the strong bond between us. September 10th, 1937. It is so strange to pick up this diary once more. At first my impulse was to tear it up, but I resisted and instead succumbed to my second desire, which was to write for a while. I am alone in my attic once more. I have been home for two months now, and after a summer spent living with my, the intense joy of being reunited with my brother, Hans has returned to the factory. Father has aged so, and Gertrude's arthritis causes her terrible pain. September 13th, 1937. After all, these four years have been kind to Father and Hans. Their relationship is less tense. They still do not exchange much conversation, but they now have a thing in common, the factory. I'm even beginning to feel a bit jealous. Silly, really. September 17th, 1937. Hans hasn't changed. To help Gertrude, he has designed a totally automated kitchen and Gertrude can't stop moaning at the wooden puppets. Oh, how I adore them. October 9th, 1937. I want to go and see father and Hans at work. I hadn't been to the factory for ages. It is strange how much it has changed. It is very curious to see them set about their tasks. I like father's new office very much. Hans has a small workshop on the first floor, crammed with arts and ends, unfinished robots and designs, exactly as I imagined it, it in fact. October 15th, 1937. The factory is working very well. Orders for toys keep coming in, spurred on by the run-up to Christmas. When I was at university and I said my name was Warlberg, people would ask me if I had any relation to the Validi Len factory. Now I know the effect that Hans's genius has had on the factory's renown. November 2nd, 1937. To make myself useful, I started helping father set his papers in order. The most extraordinary thing of all is that for the first time ever, I've had the impression that the three of us form a real family. December 8th, 1937. Hans never ceases to surprise me. Between home and the factory, his behavior is so very different. In his workshop, he is serious, concentrated, a proper young man who keeps his eye on everything going on, constantly on the move and in control. One has the impression that each single toy is his very own infant. At home he turns back into a child once more and is either moody or a happy-go-lucky buffoon. Christmas. The most wonderful Christmas of my whole life. Hans and I could not stop giggling like children beneath father's disapproving glare. I know that he was only pretending, really. Our hearts are so full of hope. 
January 5th, 1938. Hans came to see me in my bedroom yesterday evening. I felt terribly awkward, terribly ill at ease. I might have guessed. Hans wants to leave. Leave Valley Len, the house and the factory. He wants to go traveling. He doesn't know where to go for... <clears throat> or for how long. That's just like him. I was so shocked that I told him his plans were foolish. He left my room without a word. His head bowed. January 7th, 1938. I thought that he wanted to leave because of father. Not at all. It's because of the mammoths. He wants to go tracking mammoths. I thought he'd gotten over his obsession. I know my brother only too well. I wouldn't dream of telling him his quest is useless. It isn't worth it. He will not listen to reason. January 10th, 1938. I was so selfish the other evening. I returned to talk to Hans and ask him gently if he was sure of his decision. I already know what the reply is going to be. Nothing will make him change his mind. January 19th, 1938. Despite my profound sadness and despair, I must help Hans fulfill the destiny he has chosen and announce the news to father. I fear the worst. January 24th, 1938. The worst was worse than my fears. Father's anger was terrifying. He has shut Hans away in his workshop at the factory and has forbidden all visits except for Gertrude who feeds him. February 1st, 1938. Father has decided that Hans should remain locked up for as long as it takes him to abandon his infantile decision. Gertrude tells me that Hans is very disponent, yet highly resolute. The worry is driving me mad. February 6th, 1938. As soon as Gertrude returns from the factory, I hasten to get news of my little brother. He doesn't say anything, he just fiddles with bits and pieces. She replies every day with a sigh. I've tried desperately to reason with father, but I know I am just wasting my breath. February 19th, 1938. Hans is 18 years old today, and he is all on his own for his birthday. February 20th, 1938. In secret, Gertrude delivered to me a small robot from Hans. It's a robot of us as children. It works with a small cylinder punched with tiny holes. I quivered with emotions as I turned the key. The message it gave was simple. He was telling me he loved me very, very much. February 21st, 1938. Gertrude gave me a different tiny cylinder for today's toy. Hans is truly incredible. He has found a means of communicating between us and us alone in total secret. February 27th, 1938. My days are spent eagerly awaiting Hans's messages. He has now resolved to run away. He is preparing his escape like if it was a game. March 6th, 1938. Gertrude has returned and she is beside herself. Hans has disappeared. Father has not deigned to return to the workshop where he locked up his son, nor find out how he managed to escape. He just gave me a black look as if he knew we were up to something behind his back. March 7th, 1938. It is beginning to dawn on me that Hans has gone. I miss him so much. Lord, please protect my little brother and watch over him for me. March 11th, 1938. With Hans gone, father now locks himself away in night and day at the factory. The house is so gloomy now. March 12th, 1938. This morning I caught father in the drawing room installing a coffin on a trestle. The sight of it made my blood freeze. What on earth is he up to? My questions met only with stony silence and a permanent black countenance. March 13th, 1938. Behind closed curtains, the drawing room with the coffin, surrounded by huge candles, has become a veritable funeral chamber. March 14th, 1938. This is ghastly! 
I have just understood that fa what father is up to. This morning, the priest came to pray before the coffin, and f I finally caught on. Father is in mourning for the death of Hans. Father made a priest believe that his son was dead. How could he do such a thing? March 16th, 1938. In a madness occasioned by his grief, my father grows ever more cold and calculating. He contacted his old friend Dr. Small, who duly drew up a bona fide death certificate. Without even seeing the body, I dare not imagine what yarn he spun. March 17th, 1938. Hans's funeral will be officially held next Sunday. Father strictly forbade me to attend. This sort of masquerade makes me feel ill, but I cannot denounce the sub <coughs> subterfuge, or else I will display my father's mental instability to the world. The shame would kill him, that much is certain. March 23rd, 1938. I have to get away. Far, far away. April 23rd, 1938. No, I will not leave. I have fought long and hard. My life is here next to my father. He needs me too much now. The factory needs me because father is incapable of running it now. Besides, I can only find peace of mind along Hans's robots. And how shall I know when he has sent me new ones if I'm not home to receive them? No, I shall not leave. My destiny is to remain here and keep watch. 